Huh? Hmm? Tripping with trip. We're here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Tripping with trip, the podcast. Um, welcome everybody to the season finale of <clears throat> Tripping with Trip, the podcast uh, <laughs> at Habitable Spaces in collaboration and featuring Habitable Spaces, mostly on quarantine. Um, and we are with directors uh, Shane and Allison. Hey, y'all. Hey, hey, how's it going? Back. So we are doing this virtually, and we should probably mention that you guys are on rural Wi-Fi, which drove me crazy while I was out there. Ugh, it's terrible. We need I that infrastructure package. It's huge. It's huge. <laughs> I talked to I the dog on my last interview, and they were the same way out there in San Marcos. But so yeah. just a heads up that we – oh, it's thunder and lightning. I am in Dallas, the beautiful – Canyon country of Dallas, Texas, uh, at my um, parents' apart temporary apartment, which they're living in because we experienced that horrific deep freeze, uh, which um, a lot their pipes exploded in uh, downtown Dallas, and literally total loss on their home. They got run out of their home. Four inches of water. It was crazy. So lots. Lots has happened, and we're going to talk about this. What I think we should talk about is past building up to this. What uh, our first interview, which thankfully we got out of uh, uh, right before quarantine hit, we were all excited about doing a collaboration, a whole other collaboration, uh, which ended up being this collaboration, little unbeknownst to us at the time. So we can talk a little bit about our past, what built up to it, uh, our present. Now we are, uh, today is Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day, y'all. Thank Happy you to Memorial you Day. Time. All these freedoms available to us. Um, it's May 31st, Monday, 626 Texas time. And people are getting vaxxed and waxed and unmasked. I was gonna shed my mask symbolically. <laughs> We've already so, done it. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, where to begin? We, uh, I have been, and you guys can chime in anytime. This is just like cocktail conversation, basically. More dinner time conversation. I'm on a bar still with my Red Bull. Perfect. <laughs> um, so, talking about the past, basically, um, about as friends in New York, uh, you guys uh, helped me with my business, uh, which was two hours north of New York in the Catskills called Barn in the Pond. Um, you, you saw the first barn and you helped me hang up, uh, hang my beautiful art in the, um, in the renovated barn. And we're very much a part of that process. And I really appreciated that. Um, and that was in 07. Uh, in fe and... In the meantime, you guys uh, hooked up while Allison was living with me as my roommate at the time. Um, and he was practically a live-in as well, although he has his own place. Um, and, uh, we, and you uh, had been talking about starting an artist residency and, and farm, which I found out through Jamie Fine's interview. Um, love her, by the way. Uh, uh, which you guys were talking about at Flux Factory, which was an artist residence there. Um, so you had envisioned this way before it happened. Uh, and uh, I ended up, well, I had visited you guys several times. I've been helping you in whatever capacity I've been able to, to help you get habitable spaces off the ground um, pretty much from the beginning. I, I help you now with your website and your PR and marketing and visuals and stuff. And I've yeah. uh, had the pleasure of being able to meet a lot of the people who come through the, the, um, the volunteer farmers. We should mention that you're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, artist residency and self-sustainable farm. And you've been going since 08, is it? Uh, well, we, we incorporated. Sorry, eight we years. We came down here. 2011. 2011, and we got our nonprofit status, I think, in 2014. 2014. 
Okay. All right. So you are kind of a, a, a dual bit. Uh, I want to call it a business because that's how I saw it, uh, my business, but a dual nonprofit in artist residency and farming, which is a very unique combination. And I just love your, uh, you're saying that you you teach farmers how to make art and you teach artists how to farm, which is such a yeah. great. And we won't <laughs> we won't uh, go too far into all that because uh, people can can listen to all the podcasts and discover right. yeah. all the episodes <laughs> and discover this on their own. So I sold my business in February. I was slated months before to come to Austin uh, for a concert, Rufus to Soul. Uh, and uh, a couple of South by Southwest events. That was in February, sold the business, uh, but I had gotten into a podcast class because I was inspired by Habitable Spaces, by the dinnertime conversation with all the artists and the farmers and Allison's fabulous food made with everything grown <laughs> on the farm from the protein to the, uh, to the um, fruits and vegetables, just such, fabulous meals and the dinner time conversation was fabulous and mm. i think you know people need to record these conversations um because it's just so fascinating listen to all the artists and farmers two totally different cultures interact but people from all over the united states all over the world um uh, it's just so inspiring you guys are out in rural america uh, about an hour outside of Austin, hour outside of San Antonio, kind of in between the two, which is ideally located. Boy, has that area evolved since I started coming out there years ago. Um, oh, yeah. So my company in February, and I came to um, uh, Texas. Or actually, we had started getting word of, uh, of Corona back then. It was Corona. Um, so I ended up switching because South by canceled pretty early, but my concert didn't. So I ended up switching my flight to Dallas, which is where I am now, uh, to be with family just in case. But I also wanted to be close to the farm in case the zombie apocalypse happened. Mm -hmm. so, um, yes. uh, the concert canceled. Um, my dad and, and stepmother are both high risk. So I ended up um, hightailing it out to you guys just to kind of. Uh, get a you know to be there with you just in case anything happened. But I forgot to mention that we I had come there in January and thankfully gotten a a podcast a, a recording of us uh, pre pandemic. It was New Year's Eve 2020, wasn't it? Was that what it was? Yeah. It was. Yeah. yeah, that was a great party. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that was fabulous. Oh, my God. How naive were we back then uh, oh, yeah. about everything that was about to happen? So this is uh, one of our first episodes is the interview between me and you guys. And we're talking about uh, a potential collaboration that we're going to be working on in 2020. And I'll kind of let you explain to people what we talked about and, and how things uh, evolved from there. So, uh, uh, the, you know, what he's talking about cap, I think. Oh yeah. So yes, that was in the early days. Um, and I and had, I, had a, I should probably mention that I had an Airstream trailer. I was renovating for, uh, my business didn't end up using it. So had it brought down to you guys and we were talking about doing a cap and you can explain what that is and what we were thinking. Yes. Well, um, I think, uh, you know, Doing this large scale thing, funding is always the tricky part because we wanted we want to be able to pay for artists and lectures and all kinds of free festivals because I always want them to be free so that people don't have to pay for you know learning and art. Um, yeah, you that all cost community for, for for you know free entry um, uh, classes, film festivals, fall harvest. Amazing stuff. They're really lucky to yeah. have you. You're lucky to have them too. Yes, absolutely. But it all costs money to put on. So we, you know, we need to come up with the money somewhere. And um, uh, you had uh, been, I think because you had stopped doing the barn or decided you were going to maybe get out of uh, the barn on the pond, um, you were interested in trying to figure out a collaboration uh, called CAP. Uh, um, which uh, would be uh, 
God, I can't. Uh, can, camper, camper art, art and, and agriculture park. Yes. Where you can live in a camper, uh, rent a camper and live amongst the arts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we had been kind of working on fleshing that out, which would have been a, uh, I guess, kind of an Airbnb thing, really. Um, ish. But yeah. Uh, ish. Yeah. Ish. Um, and it was interesting you're because that, doing, uh, you're already doing hip camp, which I discovered mm -hmm. with my interview uh, with Sweeney, we in, which is yeah. how they discovered you. Amazing. Yeah, right. isn't that funny? Yeah, it's so funny. Know, it's basically Airbnb for camping. Yeah. Right. Yes, we had been doing that. Um, and I think, you know, uh, that whole plan of doing that seemed like a good idea until March hit. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute. Uh, I think the entire uh, landscape of Airbnb type things is mm. has completely changed because... Yeah. You know, obviously, you can't have people coming in during a pandemic. And um, so we kind of had to rethink everything uh, from the ground up. Um, but I think it was a really good challenge uh, because now what we've kind of come into is this idea that really melds better with what we're trying to do here with all of the food and going back to your uh, just what you were saying just now about the fabulous dinner parties. Um, we want to, uh, we're building up a Kingsbury Supper Club, which is going to be a restaurant, but it'll be a, a members only restaurant. I mean, anybody can join, but it'll have a membership, um, a collective membership, and those members will collectively own all of the animals. Um, so, there's a lot of benefits to that, which are if if the members of the club own the animals, then they can participate in what's called a custom exemption slaughter, which means that you know all what? of the animals. You know what, um, Allison, I hate to interrupt, but I think we should probably cover some of what happened during quarantine that built up to your decision to do this, because you also had the shop thing going, but we should talk about so what what was your impression? So we had talked about the camper arts and agriculture park New Year's Eve, and then mm -hmm. quarantine hit. I came in March, and then I think we should talk a little bit about um, how that all evolved. You had um, Wanda there was your artist in residence. Yeah. She, I got an interview with her. The Dutch was another one of my interviews. Were they there? Before? No, they had come. Uh, after being uh, uh, in pandemic in New Orleans in Cuba, right? Or did pandemic hit when no, they were there? I think they, I, f I think they got to us, and then the, then the really quarantine hit. hit. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. They, had they, had to plans, they had plans to go to New Orleans. Yes, they had. They had to cancel like their entire year of year of in Las Vegas of their trip. I mean, they were going to be running around for an entire year exploring America. And um, yeah, I think they were going to go to New Orleans after us. Um, as far as I remember. Yeah. Yeah, right. Cause they, they, they got stuck here. Yeah. They, they got, got stuck here. here. Then they basically had an RV trip. Right. And then, yeah. Bird of the day. Woo. Well, the parks are still open. So they were like getting to see the America's parks and then they were empty too. So that was kind of, they got an interesting trip, I think. Yeah. yeah. So but Wanda that was would, a moment of, uh, these are all my interviews. Wanda. So Wanda was there on lockdown. Uh, and then the Dutch were there on lockdown. I interviewed them. And then I, I ended up uh, crashing in one of your cabins for five months, which is great. Um, started in winter and, and went through to the summer. It's been years since I've experienced the seasons in Texas, and that was quite a treat. You, you made a great farmer trip. You, uh, I remember you tried to tackle a pig that was That's running right. away. Um, you did, and you, you tackled the pig, and you grabbed a hold of it, and it turned you around, and you kept going with it, but you didn't let go. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that thing seemed so bad, but I had a hold of it, man. I was not going to let go. <laughs> you were like, no, you are coming with me, pig. Yep. I'm glad it yep. wasn't it had grown up it was still quite small but yeah you yeah. guys got pigs for uh for pandemic and then the farmers market started uh, and you yeah. were you were uh, working with your collaborative farm as well and i learned so much about farming i'm literally talking to farmers 
at cocktail parties like I know what I talk what I'm talking about. Excellent. Well, you do. You were there. Yeah. I'm so we. Uh, I don't know how much of this you covered in your interviews, but we work with another farm and another farmer, um, Will Hemick, who is amazing, and he um, has a farm. This is farm, which yes. I love. Yes, he has a farm in Kingsbury. But our our place is kind of wooded and it's very difficult to grow annual crops here. So what we decided to do with the property is grow more perennial uh, crops using a food forest system. Uh, that's a permaculture method uh, where you kind of create an artificial forest system and you grow uh, perennial fruit trees and nut trees and uh, berries and herbs in that in that place. So we've set up two of those at Habitable. Yeah. But I mean, mainly what we do here. I also mentioned that we cover all of this in one of our live shoots. So before I started the podcast, we started doing uh, live Instagram shoots, which you can access on your YouTube account, right? Yeah. So this yes. Is all yeah. But it was fabulous. And so you were able to take the produce from some of this, from his farm and yours, and talk about the farmer's market a little bit about how that arose out of the need for fresh produce during quarantine. Yeah, that, that was actually, it was kind of a great opportunity for us because we're always preaching to everybody around here, like farm your own food, L no, buy locally, buy your food locally, don't go to the grocery store, don't buy something wrapped in plastic. Um, and uh, when the quarantine hit, it's like nobody wanted to go to the grocery stores anyway. So we just decided let's, start a farmer's market downtown and we started on Sundays and just set up a table and uh, started selling produce from it so people could get fresh food uh, without having to go all the way into Seguin and deal with the crowds at, at the grocery store. Seguin being the closest anyway. city, which is about 15 away. Yeah, that's about 15 miles away. Um, and it was an amazing success. And what, what was really nice about it was we, um, Set and up this, but yeah. And it's still going? It's still going. Yeah, that's what, what I was going to say. Uh, we set up this farm table and we were selling vegetables. And then, you know, people would just come and be like, hey, can I set up a table too? And we were like, come on. And uh, I mean, it's at its height, we had like 12 vendors there and it's still going to this day. It was a big day yesterday. The, the market had probably about 12 vendors. Um, we don't actually do it anymore because we don't really have time to do it. Um, but um, but we've there's a farmer down there selling veggies. There's a bunch of people selling handicrafts. It's going strong, and it's really enlivening uh, the downtown of Kingsbury. So it, it's it's kind of great because you, uh, on a Sunday you can go to Kingsbury and know that there will be something to do, food to eat, you know, interactions with friends, and um, yeah. Mm. Great yeah, and I should probably mention that what my one of my first interviews, as I kind of got to know uh, the community of Kingsbury and everything, is Mayor Shirley, who has purchased all those uh, downtown postcard perfect historic uh, buildings there because Kingsbury used to be a train town that was kind of the train depot. Um, so, so yeah, it's it was a perfect setting for a farmers market, both Absolutely. physically your community in place. Kingsbury's a cute yeah. yeah, and it was great timing, I think, also for for Shirley. I mean, uh, when we <laughs> stopped doing it, I remember Shirley was kind of razzing us a little, like, you set up this thing and now you're not doing it. But, you know, frankly, it's been great for her and it's been great for the downtown because, you know, it brings business to her store and uh, recognition to Kingsbury and people get together there. And it's, it's, it's a really great thing for, for Kingsbury. And for Shirley as as a mayor, yeah. Amazing. yeah. And so some of the things that happened during quarantine that we got on live is you got the pigs. I learned mm -hmm. how to process pigs. I recorded that whole process, which is interesting. Yep. Uh, you got, hmm? It's an intense process, and you did very well. <laughs> and a lot of hard work. That is physical labor. Yeah. That is crazy. We did things like make blood sausage. I learned how to make bread, as many of us did on quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things transpired there. I was the egg man. I was the guy who got the eggs every day and the, and the chickens from the coop. Yes. Um, 
trying to remember some of our memories that people are going to see during this podcast, both through the episodes and through the live, the live stuff. Just so much has happened. So we went through quarantine. We had, we had BLM, which I interviewed Wanda before all that happened, and just amazingly, like everything we talked about uh, came to fruition through that. Yeah, we had that. We recently the big boat, the big tanker stuck in the Suez Canal, which was a huge wake up call in the food transportation systems, which yeah. you guys are talking about from your inception, right? Yes, absolutely. That, that's something we constantly talk about. And, uh, you know, I, I am always harping on, let's get rid of the global food system. Everyone suffers. People suffer because the food isn't nutritious enough. Animals suffer within it. I mean, and as you saw during COVID, I mean, farmers were having to kill thousands and thousands of chicks and piglets and because they didn't, because it's only set up for sales. It's so ridiculous. It's not set up about the animal. It's set up for, you know, the system go, taking these animals to market. And when the, when it breaks down, well, we saw the consequences of it and uh, they were pretty grim. Yeah, I think a lot of people, including me, and I'm still, you know, ask, are asking questions that they weren't asking before. Like, wait a minute, why, you know, one of my interviews mentioned that, why do we have all this beef being raised in Texas? And I go to HEB and I get a, I see a steak from Australia. That's on the other side of the planet. You know, I mean, so it's like, insane, right? Yeah. But as one of my interviewees mentioned, I think it was Ali Stone, the mycologist, said it's not. It's not that people are anti, like all globalization. It that has its place. It's that we need to kind of we need to manage it better. I think like local. Yeah. But global where it's needed, and combine the two, but but make things a little more local to where. Um, one of my interviewees said um, the most uh, is Jamie Jamie idea who said the most radical thing you can do is is be uh, familiar with or or be close to your food source or something like that. Yes, like, yeah. Mm. I mean, especially with animals, it's so important. I mean, because mm. you and to know how they're treated and and the plants too. I mean, they've done studies about vegetables that are imported. They pick all a lot of these vegetables that are shipped for long periods of time or, you know, for uh, long distances. They pick them green and they just do not have the same kind of vitamins that yeah. that a, a vegetable picked fresh off the vine does. Yeah. So, yeah. Learned we, about that. And, also, and along those lines, the soil regeneration is a big part of the, the farming thing that I've learned is that we're... Yeah. Or it, it, with the big corporate farms, they they suck all the nutrients out, and they don't they don't rotate the crops to re uh, to regenerate the soil. So you're dealing with uh, the soil that doesn't give you the same nutrients that did before, and that's one of the yeah. things that I learned with farmer with Hefe, uh, the ma the head farmer there, who's another one of my interviews. Is he's talking about how how you you take the uh, like the goat poo or whatever he called it goat gold where you yeah, put it, yeah. you know into the chicken shit the goat shit you know on will's farm the cow shit you mix it all in and you uh and it fertilizes the soil and replenishes all the nutrients which i found yeah. interesting and that out here in texas with your clay soil is one of the most important uh things you can learn as a farmer from what, from what i gather and that's one, of the, that's one of the beauties of having a small farm is that you know, uh, I, th I think global big, big, these big corporate farms, they're using this, this extractive capitalism, which is what everybody, it's the American way, I guess, extractive capitalism. You just suck, suck all your resources out of the land and you don't give anything back and you suck it dry and then you just leave it, at, you know, or you, or you supplement it with tons of fertilizer yeah. because you have to, but regenerate uh, work like small farms regenerate the land because they put the manure back in, they put the compost back in. It's made from the you know the refuse uh, after you after you uh, harvest your vegetables. So it's putting it all back in the soil for the next time around. Yeah, yeah, a lot of amazing lessons learned uh, on that, and and you know just uh, kind of just overall, I think there was just a lot. First of all, a lot of questions being asked by people like me who had no interaction with farming or 
any of that stuff. Um, like, where's it coming? And and then I come home and, or I, you know, I, I moved to Austin and all of my stuff is coming from Amazon. And then I find out it's all from China. A you know. lot of Amazon stuff is from China. Yeah. 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 And bad yeah. thing. So that, and now yeah. we're dealing still kind of with the tail end of COVID, hopefully, where a lot of the, uh, a lot of these uh, shipping container boats are, being held in in, in in a lot of our major ports. So we have tons of empty shelves in the supermarket here in Texas. And I've heard people say the same thing. So we've got like major wake up calls going on here and major questions being asked and a lot of reprioritization. I think this podcast covers a lot of, and what you do at Habitable Spaces covers a lot of that. So I think this, everything that we've done here is really timely. I think it's going to hold hold its own over time. And I'm really excited. I'm really proud and excited about what we've achieved here, guys. And I'm I, yeah, I hey. this with you. Um, yes. Cause I've been a big believer in your message. I don't practice it, but I speak it and I try to incorporate it into my daily decision-making process. So hopefully others will do the same and, and it will affect change over time. Um, so, okay, so we had the quarantine, we decided no, you know, no public coming to on campus, but let's talk about your shop and how that's changed and how, how quarantine has kind of changed your priorities with that. Yeah, um, well, so I think going back to the cap thing, we were originally thinking we would be doing this kind of uh, Airbnb-ish experience where people could come and stay in these little cabins in the forest and interact with uh, the farm. Um, but now uh, we've been focusing on this building and this, and we've now got a 2,400 square foot shop space. And, and that was, a lot of that was achieved on quarantine, right? I mean, you had it. Yeah. You had the basis, but you know, we did a lot of work on that uh, during quarantine. Big quarantine. Yes. Yes. One of the advantages of having no work available, uh, you can just work your butt off at the farm nonstop. <laughs> Alice is saying work for pay is what she's saying. Uh, no paid work, yeah. 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 Um, so we actually got a lot done on the shop. It's almost done. Uh, we are building a commercial kitchen in there. Um, and we've got a big wood shop and kind of maker space. Um, uh, we've got an outdoor area that we're going to put a concrete pad on and a, and a roof over that'll hold all our kilns. So we'll have a ceramics studio and kiln area to fire ceramics. Yeah. And then by the dog, I mentioned that we, you guys got three kiln donations there for the pot. Yes. yes. Amazing. Four. Uh, but the three from I the oh, dog, yeah. Three from I the dog. They're all yeah. the dog. Okay. Three yeah. So that was amazing. And then Shane and I actually built ourselves some studios. So maybe one in the future we can stop working so much and make some art. Art. <laughs> Love that. Come up. Yeah. Uh, your next um, level. We were saying during quarantine. Yes. Yes. So yeah. So our main vision now, now that we have this shop is to really try to bring people in for classes, workshops, uh, you know, using the ceramics, doing ceramic classes, uh, painting classes and sculpture classes and food oriented classes. And then um, one idea that developed through the pandemic because we saw these restaurants shutting down and we're realizing and thinking about like we, Shane and I are total foodies and we love going out to eat but now it's like, well, you know, who wants to eat inside anymore? Um, so we kind of started thinking, well, maybe we should do a farm to table restaurant, get people out in the outside, you know, in the fresh air where they can come and experience the farm and have a, a farm to table meal mm -hmm. uh, at the farm. So that's kind of where the Kingsbury Supper Club idea was born in the middle sure. of COVID. Um, yeah, rethinking uh, amazing uh, culinary collaborators as well. Yes, we've had so many great chefs and butchers and uh, and yeah, culinary artists uh, come through our doors over the years, and it's been amazing. Um, and we will be collaborating with a lot of people for this supper club too. And that's actually kind of it'll be. I'm kind of seeing it as a <clears throat> almost like a gallery, like we can 
uh, take on. We're going to do monthly dinners, and then we'll probably have uh, a bar and um, uh, uh, area just open uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where you can come in and get a cheese plate with homemade cheeses and or a charcuterie board, or you know. And then once a month, we'll do dinners, and we'll be featuring different local chefs from the area, so we can bring people in and they can do a, a one night like you know guest chef thing once a month or like a weekend you know escape or like yeah a oh yeah for sure possibilities are endless i'm so excited to see what you do with that yeah I mean, so we're also so developing a gallery space in the shop too which should always have a show that's put up when we have the suffered book so yeah I'll, yeah i'll put some crap over there and maybe you know encourage people to Hopefully it'll help sale, you know, art sales that people at dinner might tend to buy stuff. We'll, we're hoping so at least. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you mentioned Shane that you worked at one of the big San Antonio museums. Which one was that? Well, Alice and I both worked at, um, at the McNay at, at the McNay, and I worked at the Briscoe for five years almost. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so and then you knew about all the moving walls, how to light for galleries and how you're going to be, you're going to know how to right. show it. You can't wait to see that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we are going to. Yeah, we're not sure if it's going to so be a, a hard space, like a, a like a hard, uh, what am I trying to say? We don't know if it's going to be movable walls that set up the gallery space that separate it from the rest of the shop space or if it's actually going to be like a permanent, permanent thing. Uh, thing. We're figuring that part out. Um, it might actually be a permanent thing. And then if you cool. want to use that room for something else, you can use it, but it's just, it'll be outfitted out to, to, to be a gallery space and have air conditioning and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got those beautiful glass garage doors, which I see all over Texas to make an indoor outdoor space, which I love. It just looks really exciting. And it did not yeah. look like that when I the quarantine. That's something, that is a quarantine success story. That is, yeah. absolutely. Because I think when you first came down, all we had was a, a, a metal roof and this amazing, um, uh, uh, really one of our it. friends uh, had made this, uh, we got a bunch of drill pipe and he welded together the frames. Um, so it was just a roof Yeah, it was just with a roof. no concrete floor or anything. And the back wall was started. Amazing. Yeah. And so we poured all the concrete, got all the walls up, got it insulated, got it wired. Um, yeah, it's well, been a. Yeah. And I, we poured a few concrete rounds while I was there on yeah. quarantine. Yeah, you were there popping around in the all concrete. Four of them out of five, right? Or all five? Yeah, yeah man. Trip it took you us yeah, it, we broke each bay up into a pour. Yeah. So it was five pours. It was too expensive, I found out. Like you had to kind of just go as you could afford to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's that and it's, it, it's it, a lot it, of labor you have to make a huge, huge form to do it all at once. And I don't, we don't really have the expertise to do that. We're not really concrete people, so we didn't really want to try to go huge. Well, it looks, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it did go big, but it in parts. <laughs> and I would hope that you could uh, put a few butch notches on your belt there, trip with a concrete pouring, um, tackling pigs, uh, you know, all the farming. <laughs> <laughs> notch, 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 notch. <laughs> that was yep. fun. yeah great okay so we've talked about your uh everything that's going to happen in the future and um gosh what what else what should we talk about to just kind of like get people who haven't uh seen any of the listen to any of the episodes or see seen any of the live footage what should we um well, um i I'm kind of thinking, so we're, we've been out on this property for nine years now. And, um, so we're kind of getting to this new phase. I mean, a lot of it's built finally. Um, yeah. so I think looking, looking forward to the future, you know, it's more about bringing community in to really enjoy what we have to offer, uh, teaching people, you know, the supper club, feeding people. Um, and then with the supper club, we're also going to be, you know, they'll be kind of joint owners of the animals. So we'll have the animals there so they can kind of learn about dairy goats and just how to care for animals, you know, and chickens. Like, you got your and chicken. yeah. yeah. There's a lot of learning potential there. And I love when people first hit the farm and they're like, Oh my, this place is 
amazing. But then they start asking questions about the chickens, the goats, the farm, you know, the garden you have over there, uh, the structures that you've built all yourself. Um, I think it's a really exciting uh, future ahead of you. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely excited. Um, we're gearing up. We're already having meetings with folks in our community. Um, so even though we've been out here nine years, we have been operating as habitable spaces entity for ten years now because we started in New York City, like you had said before, um, mm -hmm. with uh, planning it, and um, we had our first official official function um, at the end of October in New York um, in 2011. Yeah. So. Um, that we had this huge party um, in the fall, and it was a costume party with bands and an art silent art auction and performer performers, and it was a blast. Fun. So, um, so this year is going to be our tenth um, fall, you know, f fall harvest event, um, and we're going to make a huge big deal about it. Uh, it's going to be downtown. We've already been having meeting meetings with a bunch of local um, Kingsbury folks who are going to help out. And um, I think it's going to be a, a big community uh, affair with, you know, live music and all kinds of interactive art pieces. And so that'll be a blast. So November 13th, fall harvest gang. Mm -hmm. All right. And hopefully I'll, um, be able to interview uh, Rigo Berto, who is what is what did he do for you on that? So yeah, we're about to do. Uh, we didn't Curator. do a summer a summer. We do a summer film fest every year as well, um, which we started five years ago. I think this would be our this would be our sixth one. I have to count. I can't really. Remember, I don't want to say that because I don't trust. Us. Yeah, um, we that. didn't do one last year because of COVID. Um, so now we're starting those up again. So it's a summer film fest that we do, and our film fests are always a little different because we we Have don't just show we don't just show like up and coming films. We show we get in, we we always get a curator, an artist uh, to curate it, and then it's whatever they want to do. But they're all typically art films. Yes, okay. uh, there is a feature. There so is typically what, a feature as well. What is the so general? Very, oh, yeah, you yeah. didn't really answer the. I was worried about that. Rigo Berto Luna is the, the director uh, and yeah. co-founder of um, a Press -a House Gallery, and for us, he is the curator for the film festival. Yes. Okay. Press -a House being one of the big galleries in San Antonio. Mm hmm Yes, it's a wonderful gallery. It's, uh, you know, Rigo Berto usually curates uh, music in the backyard, and then there's just a, he's got a great uh, community around him, and he always has the best shows. He He's really got a great eye. Um, for art and so we're super excited to to uh, have him working with us so that that event is going to be on saturday the uh, uh june 12th let me just make sure <laughs> yes don't worry about it people are going to be viewing this hopefully years later yeah. so don't worry about the day yeah. but it's just good to know what's going on and the kind of people you have involved and and the kind of things you do. So Fall Harvest, Film Fest, um, anything else we should mention that you do on a yearly basis? Um, well then, I mean, so those are our two big ones. Um, hopefully in the next couple of, well, I'm hoping we can, we're, we have another festival that we want to add, which is going to be our Golden Age Revival Festival. Um, mm -hmm. It'll probably be 2022 uh, before we can get that one off the ground, but that one's going to be... It's going to be longer. Uh, <laughs> no, Sorry, I'm always the, op I'm, I'm the pessimist. I I'm love the, realist, hear the, the voice. Of it's going to be longer. But <laughs> it's At been, some point. It's been fun watching you two work together, too. That was one thing I got out of living with you for five months is watching you operate together. I'm like, oh, so this is how it worked. It was really, it's cute. It's really, it's a good synergy. I'm glad, that, I'm glad it's the word that came to your mind. I say yes. <laughs> Shane says no. That's how it works. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. I say yes to everything. Let's jump into the abyss. Let's let's power power forward into the unknown and he's like hell no Why no we're not no, doing that no no, not, no 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 okay it's not a no it's uh well yeah, have yeah, we thought no. about all this really what i say <laughs> i because grew to appreciate I know from us that. doing this project that there's been too many times that we've built into our own problems especially like doing construction and us not knowing it starting off like mm -hmm. when you don't know what you're doing in construction you will build into your own problems and you will have to yeah. tear stuff out that you've done 
So yeah. I'm always like, let's think about everything before we do anything kind of person. But I could sit there and think about it all day and Allison wants to swing a hammer when she doesn't know what she's going to build. But, you know, it's kind of somewhere in between there. We find some happy balance. Yeah. And I'm glad yeah. cute's the word that came to mind. I, I love watching it. It's, it's so much fun. Well, um, <laughs> well, this is all amazing. Uh, I think we should probably close out. I'm supposed to keep it under an hour, and I haven't been tracking time because we've been picked up in Berlin. <laughs> I love it. Y'all are playing in Berlin. Yes, so. that's exciting. Yeah, it looks like we have been on for 40 minutes. Um, You've been telling me. Yeah, uh, yeah, we will. Um, well, I'd just like to say maybe one last thing. Yeah. Um, this project has been an amazing project to found with Shane and with all the people that we've come through and who have helped us like you. And I mean, we've had so many hundreds of people come here and swing a hammer, help us with ideas, help us with, you know, all kinds of support. And it, it, it is built by many hands and many minds. This place, this place is a huge gargantuan collaborative art piece. And, yeah. uh, it's been a it's been a challenge to think about because it, you know it's always hard doing something that's not been done before uh, just because there's no roadmap to, to help You're you your own trails yeah yeah and um, and I'm just you know it, I'm I'm really grateful to you for doing this podcast actually because you are celebrating some of the people that we love and including yourself and uh, that we love and who have worked with us in the past and will work with us in the future and just kind of a little glimpse into the huge family that is habitable spaces. I mean, you know, Shane and I are just the, the initial like visionaries, but there's so many people who, who have added to and, and helped create this space. Yeah. So. I think one of the unexpected themes of this entire podcast has become community. And there are so many, you have so many different levels of community. You know, you had your, your New York community before, which I interviewed, you know, people like Jamie Fine and people that were mm. with you before. And then you had the Kingsbury community. I got to interview Mayor Shirley and uh, so many amazing people there in Kingsbury. You got really lucky with that, with that rural oh, Texas. Well, Trip, I'll say this though. I like, love this town. You almost, um, like you bringing it all out by doing each podcast and interview. I mean, it's like the dynamic, um, an eclectic nature of some of the people we know. I mean, it's just the way you brought all the best out of them. It's kind of like seeing them all through your show is kind of like, Oh wow, I guess we do know those people and all this stuff, but it seems more interesting through your lens than maybe it is in my own brain or whatever, you know, um, it's, yeah, there's some I actually got to know you guys better through our interview, which was interesting because a lot of what we talked about, we didn't really think about talking about before. So I got to know you as well, which was re ah. very, very, Awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and we're going to keep on finding new people to work with and keep on expanding our community. And yeah. Yeah. And the other really part of this community factor, I think, is the fact that everyone kind of went digital. I didn't even know what Zoom was before all this happened. And I discovered it there on the farm in quarantine. And now look at what we're doing with all this stuff. You know, we've talked about, you know, if you were on the fence going digital, a lot of people got pushed over whether they liked it or not. So um, I think this is, uh, you've got people all over the world, including the Berlin people who picked us up on the podcast. Thank you for that. Um, but I think yeah, it's I love them. here is you've, you're, you're starting a global community and a lot of this is due to your um, digital endeavors. And I think that's a very exciting uh, part of, of where you're going in the future with all this stuff as well. Well, maybe we should bring back one point too, which is like, you know, here we are harping on getting rid of the global capitalist system, but you know, the perfect replacement for that is the global localized system. Like right. let's talk really. village to village, let's talk person to person. We have the means through the internet to create a, a huge global local village. And, and that's what's so important because we all need to care about each other in this future world. We all need to help each other. We all need to help each other make better choices when we're not, you know, when we're not uh, thinking about the planet or, or the community or whatever. And, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's. Uh, and better choices 
for you may not be better choices for someone in uh, Sweden, for example. You know, mm -hmm. our, each little local community I'm learning has its own chemistry, its own strengths, its own weaknesses. Some things they can do local, but some things they would need to rely on the global for. So it's just a matter of finding that balance. You know, what's in your wheelhouse? What can you lean on I have the dog for, for example, or other mm -hmm. people? do what you do other farmers like will's farm for example it's like yep. uh, learn that you don't do it all yourself there you have collaborative chemistry with people um, depending on what you have to offer in the community which i found fascinating yeah yeah and it leads to so such a richer life you know when you when you are collaborating with people uh just on a daily basis about with everything i mean you just you have this beautiful rich inclusive life that yeah it's, a, it's good <laughs> yeah 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 and it reminds people that you know their neighbors are there you know sometimes you're going to need to lean on your neighbor so don't piss them off too soon because they, they might be in the you know in the northeast they you, you know they might be um scraping the snow out of your driveway or mowing your lawn or helping you when you're out of town or whatever so you know Get to know your neighbors and your farmers. I love that. Get to know your farmers. Yes, yes. Get to know your farmers. Yeah. And the and the animals and plants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And actually, well, one thing I always say also is the community extends beyond our human community. We have to also think about the animals and plants and the world we live in and all the other creatures we share this space with because it's not just humans, you know. Yeah, for so sure. Habitat. We need to focus on creating habitat or preserving habitat for all the different animals that are keeping us alive, you know, and plants. Yeah. 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 So many. I learned a lot about, uh, you know, things we can eat and things we can't eat when we had that mushroom incident where, where we yeah. oh. the mushrooms and the farmers who did it didn't quite look close enough at the diagram and, um, few people got sick that's on the on the dutch interview by the way it's hilarious <laughs> there you go. it's in there then it's yep. in there it's so good it's so good <laughs> yeah all right well closing thoughts um i think that covid has uh, you know i've been talking to a lot of people about covid uh and so many people have said you know what it's kind of weird because it's it sucked, but it was also kind of an amazing thing. And it's made people more introspective and thinking about community more. And I think it's, it's a teacher, you know, like any good trauma, it, uh, it has taught all of us um, that we need to love our neighbor and be together as a community and stop all the hatred, man. You know, don't be hating on your neighbor. Don't be it, it, divisiveness just keeps us apart. And, and, you know, inclusiveness and community makes us stronger so yeah absolutely. that's what i hope for the future and absolutely eat local. <laughs> yeah and trip you did such a good job on the whole thing i would say everybody go out there and listen to all the trips oh Tripping man trip. it's so damn good trip they are so damn good it's been such a well, pleasure I to listen to not have had better more interesting dynamic creative guests that i really appreciate because i learned so much from each one of them i'm just like i i end up talking about the things that they taught me in daily conversation i'm like wow I've learned about farming, about mycology, about pottery. I'm talking, I'm talking languages that I never spoke before. And for someone like me, it's just like, that is the creme de la creme of why I'm doing this. It's just so yeah. exciting. And I really hope to Life. continue this collaboration because it's, it's worked out beautifully, I think. And in the words of Auntie Mame, life is a banquet, darling, and most poor fools are starving to death. Starving. Oh. Like, stop. Oh. <laughs> so let's not starve. Let's sit down at the banquet table and dine. I and love, love it. Our <laughs> let's do it. And let's um, close out. We've, we've, we've got to talk about Seth's song. So Seth is one of the farmers that you collaborate oh, yeah. with. He helped you build um, the, the uh, maker space out there. And he and his band, Train Town, who met through you, all Kingsbury yeah. boys, we're kind enough to do just an amazing job on the music on this podcast. So I think we should close out with that. 
Yay. Yes. Yay, um, Seth. Go for it. And Again, Jerry and the whole thing. You guys, I, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am that I that you let me quarantine on the farm because in relative to some of our friends in New York, LA and other places, wow, we had it really good because we were out there in rural America. We we didn't quite get the the brunt of what a lot of the city folk did. So I'm just so incredibly grateful for you guys for everything. Yes. Well, sure. I'm grateful to have you there. And Sorry, also, the internet's not better. Yeah. I know, right? We need to work on that one. <laughs> I yeah. Know. Uh, right. But yeah, I, I feel so bad for our New York City friends, too, and all the people who were isolated during this whole time. And hopefully they're out partying now with their vaccinations and having some fun. Yeah, and California, same way. And we'll, we'll be glad to have the comedians, the bands, the you know the films the television shows like all these all these things that we were missing before i hope they come back yeah me too they will they will all right well we're going to close out with Seth's song thanks a lot this is the, be- right. the end of this season but the beginning of new interviews uh with you guys in collaboration with me and we'll figure it out as we go as we do wonderful <laughs> Bye, Shane. Bye, Allison. Thank you, guys. Bye, Trip. <laughs> Tripping down here without reservations, without knowing his destination. But now he's here, but not quite clear. What he will do. Some friends from habitable spaces to come on over to one of our places. We jumped right into life on the farm. Hey, don't you fly to cry? Everybody's got a thousand times to cry. Hey, don't you fly to cry? Find your place in the sky. Thank you.